apologetics must, must be a part of church discipleship. That's why morality is relative in Americans throughout the West today, because man now determines truth. And I believe that that's why the nation is in the state it's in, because uh, they don't know the Word of God, and because the church has failed, in a sense, to hold forth the Word of God in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Welcome to Heritage of Truth. Today our guest is Dr. Richard Land. Welcome to our show. Thank you. It's good to be with you. Okay, would you please tell our viewers what your position is right now and, and the things that you've done? Because I don't think I can remember them all. <laughs> well, for the last four and a half years, I've been the president of Southern Evangelical Seminary in Charlotte, North Carolina. And um, we are a seminary that is, that is dedicated to apologetics and, and answering people's honest questions and, and equipping people to go out and defend the Word of God in order to win people to Jesus. We are, have an online presence. Uh, about 60% of our students are online. We have 10% uh, of our students are overseas. Uh, we have, we're training missionaries in place in Bangkok and Manila and Tokyo and in Taiwan. Uh, pastors of little churches and they're taking classes from us and learning more about the Bible and how to defend the Bible and the evidences for the Christian faith. We have a lay institute as well. If people want more information about us, they can go to ses.edu. We're all about building up people to build up the kingdom for the furtherance of the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Before that, for 25 years, I was the president of the Southern Baptist Convention's Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, which was the public policy agency of Southern Baptists. And People asked me when I retired after 25 years if I was leaving, if I was retiring. I said, no, I'm just going from a, from a combat command to a training command. <laughs> I'm now training the next generation of Green Berets and Navy SEALs and Army Rangers for Jesus Army. What do you see as the most important task for believers in our culture today? To speak the truth and be prepared to defend the truth. Mm -hmm. I think the way we're going to expel evangelism and missions and discipleship in the 21st century is apologetics. Mm -hmm. uh, we live in a post-Christian culture that's hostile to the Christian faith, and we need to be able to always be ready to give a reasonable explanation of the hope that lies within us. And so we've got to, be, we've got to understand what a biblical worldview is, and we've got to be prepared to defend the biblical worldview to people who don't accept a biblical worldview. I tell our students all the time, because we tend, we tend to get the, the Army Ranger types. And I say, look, we want to win the argument, but we don't just want to win the argument. We want to win the person. Our enemy is not our opponent. Our enemy is the prince of darkness. Right. And so I have to really, you know, guys, look, you know, <laughs> don't, don't go for the jugular so fast. <laughs> you, know, you, want to, you want to win the argument in a winsome way if you can. Right. Um, but I tell our students all the time and our other professors do, look, you may be smarter than I am. I hope you are. Mm -hmm. But right now I know more than you do. So that's why you're here. You're here. We're not here to learn together. We're here for me to teach you what I know, and hopefully you and the Lord will do more with it than I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So where does education fit in? Obviously, you're doing what you're doing at, at the Southern Evangelical Seminary, but how about students that don't go there? Well, we, uh, we believe that education is critical. I mean, you know, the, the Great Commission says go into all the world and preach the gospel. Mm -hmm baptize them and make disciples and, and teach them all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And I think one of the great failings of the Christian church in all denominations in the last half of the 20th century is we did not teach what we believe and why we believe it. Mm -hmm. And we're paying the price for it now. Yes, we've we had are. A, we've had an evangelical heart, but we haven't had an evangelical mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. We're supposed to love him with our heart, soul, That's right. mind, That's right. and strength. Yes. Yeah, the mind is what people seem to have left out for several Well, years. I'm afraid so. And, yeah. and you know, it, we end up with people who have um, what, I, what, what psychologists call a compartmentalized attitude structure. I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. classic example is Jimmy Carter, mm -hmm. who ran for president in 1976, and I'm old enough to remember. <laughs> and he said, uh, I'm, I'm a born-again Christian, mm -hmm. and I believe in the basic goodness of the American people. Well, if you're a born-again Christian and you understand what you're talking about, you don't believe in the basic goodness of anybody. <laughs> but, but Jimmy Carter had in, in compartmentalism in his mind a, a, a Christian personal relationship but a liberal worldview living in the same mind which yeah. you know when I went to England to do my doctorate I'd been there three days and the, 
the uh, recruiter for the local socialist club showed up to sign me up. <laughs> and I, did, I said, what, what made you think I'd want to be a member of the socialist club? He said, well, you're a Christian. He said, you have to be a socialist. And so I said, well, come on in. Let's have a cup of tea and talk about that. And I said, you know, basically, you just said something that's totally nonsensical. If you're, if you're a Christian and you believe the Bible, then you can't be a socialist. Because socialism, the basic premise of socialism is that human beings are either basically good or they're basically neutral. And they will work according to their ability and receive according to their need. I said, the Bible says the heart of man, Jeremiah 17, 9, is, is uh, deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? If that's true, socialism has never worked. It will never work. But pure capitalism won't either because capitalists are also sinful. Right. So you have to have a system of checks and balances. Mm -hmm. You were on the uh, religious ERLC. Oh, the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission. Thank you. Yes, yeah. the ERLC, yes. So what exactly is religious liberty? I mean, people talk about freedom of yeah. religion. Let's, well, let's religious, define religious what religious liberty really is. is um, you render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar. Mm -hmm. and unto God the things that are God's. Mm -hmm. It means your ultimate allegiance is to God. And as an American, uh, I believe that the Declaration of Independence is recognizing a universal value when it says that all men are created equal and they're endowed with their creator with certain unalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so it's, it's Baptists are the reason that the First Amendment is in the Constitution. If you go back and study the history, the Baptists were not going to vote for the Constitution because they were, they, were, they were very suspicious of a federal church. Mm -hmm. And so a man named John Leland, who was a Baptist preacher in Virginia, and James Madison cut a political deal. Mm -hmm. and the political deal was that Leland would get the Baptists to vote for ratification of the Constitution. In the first Congress under that Constitution, Madison said, I'll bring in an amendment that says, Congress shall make no law affecting an establishment of religion nor, nor interfering with the free exercise thereof. Mm -hmm. And so basically uh, all the restrictions in the, in, the, in the Constitution are on the government, mm -hmm. not on people. Um, it's the government that can't found a religion. It's the government that can't interfere with your free exercise. I can't, I can't violate the First Amendment. I'm not the government. That's right. So um, religious freedom means you're free to pursue your conscience and to worship as you please or not worship as you please with no civil penalties. When Roger Williams founded Providence Plantations in 1636, he founded the first government anywhere in the Western world for over a thousand years. Where you were not only free to worship as you please, you were free to not worship at all, sit home and shut peas on the front porch and not get arrested for violating the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. That's religious freedom. How can we exercise our freedom of religion and our, our religious liberty biblically as citizens in a country where our liberties seem to be falling away, we seem to be losing ground. Well, we, the only way that we're going to be able to exercise, in order to keep them, we've got to exercise them. Okay. Uh, we have to insist upon um, they, they're being recognized. And when the government asks us to uh, do something that is contrary to our conscience, then uh, we follow the example of Martin Luther King Jr. and we practice civil disobedience. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean um, being violent. It doesn't mean disobeying the law and expecting not to have to pay the penalty. Every American citizen should have to read Dr. King's letter from the Birmingham yes. jail before they graduate from high school. Mm -hmm. It's actually as eloquent as the I Have a Dream speech is, the letter from the Birmingham jail is more powerful. Mm -hmm. And in it, he says, I'm in this jail because I refuse to obey an unjust law. And it is an unjust law because it doesn't coincide with the moral law of God. Mm -hmm. If he'd written that letter from the Birmingham Hilton, it wouldn't have had any impact. Right. He wrote it from the Birmingham jail. Mm -hmm. He didn't question the state's authority. He questioned the state's authority to compel him to obey an unjust law. Right. And it takes a lot more for us to do what Dr. King did than it did for Dr. King because we have peaceful redress of grievance. He couldn't vote. Mm -hmm. Most of the people that were being victimized by segregation couldn't vote. We can vote. Mm -hmm. So we have to exhaust the political process and the judicial process first, in my opinion, before it's moral to resort to breaking the law. Mm -hmm. Because we do need to respect the law. We're going to obey the law for conscience sake, unless we cannot. Mm -hmm. I grew up during the Vietnam War era. I was in college and took a student deferment. And then when I was a senior, 
uh, they went to the lottery system and I had a high lottery number. If I had been asked to serve, I would have gone. But I have respect for those who said they could not serve and who went to jail. Mm -hmm. I have no respect for those who went to Canada. Right. Okay. Well, back to the, the school. What can parents do in their homes to teach their children apologetics as they're coming up before they get to college? It's a great, great question. And um, we, we try to address it. Uh, we have a lay institute mm -hmm. where we teach the courses. So they're not quite at the level of college courses. Any, mm -hmm. any parent who's a high school graduate can take these courses and profit from them. Mm -hmm. For instance, our founder, Dr. Geister, does the first course on introduction to apologetics. Mm -hmm. And the professor comes in and says, now here's what Dr. Geister is going to say. <laughs> and then we have Dr. Geister say it. And then we have the, the professor come back on and say, now here's what Dr. Geister just said. And uh, so they can, they can get um, mentored and then teach their children. We also have dual credit programs. We have 12 hours, um, four three-hour courses that we recommend for high school students, especially homeschool students, but any high school students. But they can get high school credit and then they can get college credit as electives. And we call it our vaccination program. <laughs> if you're going to send your children to the University of Florida or, or UNC, Chapel Hill, uh, we want to vaccinate them against liberalism first. So the first course is on um, the arguments for the Christian faith. Then the second course is on Christian doctrine. The third course is on world religions and you know why Islam's wrong and why Buddhism's wrong. And then the fourth one is on the pressing issues of the day. I teach that class on Christian ethics. What does the Bible say about abortion? What does the Bible say about homosexuality? What does the Bible say about transgenderism? To prepare our young people before they go off to college. If we don't teach them, in, in the ethics class, I talk about sex. I mean, if we don't teach them what the Bible says about sex, they're going to learn it. They're going to learn. They're going to get a miseducation from the world on the internet from pornography. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like you're doing some really good work there. I believe we are, and um, we, you know, people are responding to it. Uh, but we're, we're there to serve the church. We, um, when I came there, uh, forty percent of our students were online. Now at sixty percent and growing rapidly. Mm -hmm. uh, of that sixty percent, eighty percent are taking the classes in live action. We, we offer our classes at night. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a uh, son-in-law who just finished a Master's of Arts in uh, Apologetics mm -hmm. from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. He didn't come on campus until he graduated. Uh, he took all but three of his classes, were live classes at night. Um, mm -hmm. He could see us. He could talk to us. We could talk to him. We just couldn't see him in his cutoffs and flip-flops. <laughs> well, have you had any reports? Um, I don't know how long you've been open, but have you had any reports back from, from people who have utilized oh, these yeah. with their students? Yeah before they went to a secular university. Yeah. Rossio Christie's a ministry that's sort of a, 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 a apologetics version of Campus Crusade. Right. It was started at our school and spun off from us. Okay. And about half the people who are Rossio Christie um, guys on different college campuses are our graduates. Oh, wow. Our fastest growing program is our Dean Men program for pastors who are out there on the front line. Mm -hmm. And they, they, I gotta get apologetics. If I'm gonna do my job, I've gotta get yeah. apologetics. So they come to us. And, uh, okay. and we are able to help equip them. Okay. Well, is there anything that you would um, like to say to the audience as a closing statement? Claim Second Chronicles 7.14. I know it originally applied to Israel, but it applies to any country. So for us as Americans, it applies to America. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. What that tells us is that whether America has a future worth having doesn't depend on what the lost people do. It depends on what the saved people do. If the saved people get right with God, then God will send a revival. And you know, all great movements of God start with a revival. It's called a revival. You gotta be revived before you can be revived. <laughs> and when God's people get right with God, lost people notice. And they, they want to know what's happened to us. And we get to tell them and people start getting saved. And when the saved people get revived and the lost people get saved and they begin to apply the truth of the scripture to the evils of society, then you can have a reformation. And what we must have in America is a reformation. And it won't come from Washington. Uh, all this last election did was give us a little more time, a little more time. But Washington is a caboose, not a locomotive. When the people change, Washington will change. What we've got, and, and this is the order. It's not a reverse order. Revival first, then awakening, and then reformation. Folks, 
The revival's got to start somewhere. It's got to start with someone. Why not you? It's got to start somewhere. Why not where you are? It's got to start sometime. Why not now? The future of our country is being determined one part, one family, one church at a time all across the United States. Good words. Where can people find out more about you and the school? Online? They can go to ses.edu. I have a two-minute radio commentary every day on the news of the day from a Christian perspective, and all those are archived there. They can find out how they can get uh, information about how they can enroll as students uh, online, how they can take part in our dual credit program, how they can take part in our um, um, lay institute program, and how, they can, and how they can come to our, we have the longest running apologetics conference in the country. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Williams, for thank being Thank you. Our guest. Thank you for having me. God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. <laughs> Amen. I know.